23. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there are some on the table up the back, I think, or yeah, yell out or wave out. You should be able to get one to you. So Matthew 23. Um, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on a father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin but you have ne neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Other you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who send to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hand gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
Thanks, Serene. Oh, my name's Josh. I think I'm turned on. Okay. I'm married to Sarah over there. We've just got back from two weeks on holidays. Um, I don't know if you've just come back as well, but we went to two big things. We went and visited my family in Coffs Harbour at the Big Banana, and we literally went to the Big Banana and walked through it, and the kids thought it was amazing. And then we went to Tamworth, and we saw the big guitar This is as we were driving out of town. And then we discovered one more big thing on the way home, a big hat. So there you go. Australia has a big hat, just big enough to cover a table in the home of Banjo Patterson. Now that was something that was quite irrelevant. But uh, today we've got quite an important question about God. Is God irrelevant in 2022? Is God irrelevant? Now the people who sent in this question expressed it a little differently to that. Uh, they weren't asking it in the sense of, you know, do we really need God today? Like, you know, a person who can walk doesn't need crutches. You know, we don't really, is God still relevant? We don't really need him, right? We're fine. And they weren't really asking it in the sense of, uh, isn't it silly to believe in God now? You know, like, we no longer believe that the earth is flat. And if you sail far enough, you're going to plummet off the edge. And likewise, we don't believe in God anymore. We've, that's just a bit silly. We, we know how things work now. But they weren't quite asking it like that either. Now, either of those might be your question, right? You might, as you came today, you might be thinking, actually, I kind of feel like God's irrelevant because I don't need him. Or I feel like God's irrelevant because haven't we just, hasn't science explained things by now? But the people who are asking this question, we're asking it with a different tone. Uh, because we've rephrased the question for today. But it was the sense of, how dare you still believe in God in 2022? That is, isn't God irrelevant is the polite way of putting the sentiment, you know, how could you continue to believe this stuff? It's harmful, it's bad, it's just beyond the pale. And that's what we're tackling today. Uh, in uh, English history, if you go back to the 12th century, um, you can fact check this with Ed later. Um, King uh, Henry II conquered parts of Ireland and set up a, you know, English rule over the land there. And this English territory in Ireland was called the Pale, the Pale. And once you went beyond the boundaries of the Pale, you were outside the authority and the safety of English law. And so you were in danger from all the Irish savages. And so beyond the Pale, became this phrase meaning outside the limits, right? You've gone beyond. And you've gone beyond what is acceptable behavior and practice to go beyond the pale. And that's a term that gets thrown around a lot in Australia at the moment. That isn't God irrelevant in 2022? Well, it's the sense that isn't believing in God simply beyond the pale? This is something that's outside the acceptable limits of behavior and practice. I wonder if that's your question. Well, let me give you a couple of stats in this. So uh, there's a group that do a survey in Australia called the National Church Life Survey. It's a, a high quality and reputable um, survey. They, the last one they ran, November 2019, they asked people the question, is religion good for society? And a little breakdown of the answer. So four in 10, 41% agreed that religion is good for society. 36% were neutral or unsure. 23% disagreed with that. Religion is not good for society. And that, gives, that might reflect this room a little bit. Although I'm guessing that there's more Christians here. So you're thinking actually, no, Jesus is good for society. Maybe we need to think about the religion pace a little bit more. Um, but it's also an important question about God. Is he irrelevant? Because we're not actually as disinterested in God as we might think or as the, the media might be. So in Australia, 22% of people attend a religious service regularly, which means at least monthly. 32% uh, of people pray or meditate at least once a week. 60% um, believe in God or a higher power, right? 
So three out of five people. You think about the houses around you, 60%, three out of those five houses, people in there who believe in God or a higher power. And uh, 45% of people say that faith or spirituality is important for them in making life decisions. And so it's not as if as a society, we've actually completely jettisoned belief in God or a higher power. We might be unsure about who he is or what it means. And it's not as if as a society, we've moved away from practicing religious things. We still do it. And yet there's a significant concern within Australia, shared in many countries of the world, that no religion is actually harmful in society. And one in four people might believe something like that. Now, why is that? Well, um, I'll take you back. So uh, when I was at, in, at the end of uni, so 2008, through, and for the next five years after that, I was speaking at these um, year 12 study camps, helping people get ready for their end of school exams. And these were Christian study camps and the students would come away together. And as they studied, we'd have breaks and we'd also uh, help the students the students think about Jesus for themselves before they finish school. Um, so I'd be speaking, we'd have question time regularly. I noticed over these five years, a significant transition in the big questions people were asking. Uh, one of the questions that was always there was the sense that belief in God is unnecessary. That idea that God is a crutch. And most of these kids were coming from um, well-to-do families, uh, from private schools in the North Shore of Sydney. So this is a fairly elite bunch of people in Australian society um, who have a lot of money that can tend to fix problems. And so that sense, well, well, God is just there for the people who need him, right? He's a crutch for the weak. Um, so there's always that there. But around 2008, the main questions were around, uh, isn't belief in God foolish? Surely science has done away with the need for the existence of God. We know how things work, so we don't have to go, God did it. We know there's something like a big bang and therefore we don't need God. Like that was some, seems the logic of the, the students. But by the end of the five years, no one was really asking those questions anymore or bringing up those points. Uh, instead, it was you no, know, to believe in God, it's harmful. Um, God, you know, it's, it's not like a crutch. It's not like a foolish plunge off the edge of the earth. It's more like God is a leech in medicine. He's the harmful belief of the past that sucks the goodness out. And that's been there across generations, but it, it's come up stronger and stronger in the last five years in Australia. So I think for my parents, um, you'd get this sense that God is actually harmful, more in, in the sense of songs like John Lennon's Imagine, right? Lennon's Imagine. It's kind of the atheist catch cry song. There was actually an atheist church that got kicked off in the UK. It was a bit of an experiment. And uh, you can watch it on YouTube. It's a little bit funny. But um, they, they, they try and get people into this sort of church experience and they actually sing Imagine. <laughs> it's like a great song. Um, but imagine, imagine there's no heaven, Lennon sings. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to imagine all the people living life in peace. And so that's Lenin's song, that's his vision for the world, that if we just took all these things that divide us out of it, especially religion, the idea of heaven above, hell below, a God who rules, a final destiny, if we just took religion out of it, then people could live in peace. Um, that was my parents' generation. I think for the people slightly older than me and, and for myself at uni, it was people like Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens. He was the influential voice saying that you no know, belief in God is harmful. Uh, Hitchens wrote a bunch of books, debated a lot of people. Um, one of his famous uh, writings is Religion Poisons Everything. And that was his sentiment. It's not just that belief in God is foolish. It's not just that, uh, you know, it's unnecessary. It's that it poisons, really. It poisons. He says, we believe with certainty that an ethical life can be lived without religion. And we know for a fact that the corollary holds true. 
that religion has caused innumerable people not just to conduct themselves no better than others, but to award themselves permission to behave in ways that would make a brothel keeper or an ethnic cleanser raise an eyebrow. Uh, you've just been hitch slapped. <laughs> to use the term. Right? Hitchens, uh, he's, he's taking no prisoners, right? He's out to offend and, and ridicule as a way of changing people's minds. But do you, do you hear what he's saying? He's saying religion's harmful. You know, people use religious beliefs and their religious identity as a way of justifying things that any sensible person can see are terrible, wicked, immoral things to do. Now, Hitchens was saying that when I was at uni, but I don't think many people actually agreed with him because the Christians that they know just weren't like that. And that's still the case today. Uh, the, this NCLS looked at church. The, how do people feel about church? It's like 37% think churches are uh, actually a good place to go. How do they feel about Christians? Well, 88% said they're really positive or neutral to their Christian friends, right? So as people get to know individual Christians, they're like, yeah, this doesn't really match up what Hitchens is saying. But their opinion of church has plummeted. It raises a question about God. And so what's been happening? We've had people like this all throughout history, but, you know, Lennon for our, my parents, um, Hitchens for my, my time at uni. Uh, but in the last five, 10 years, think about some of the things that have just had this massive, massive shift in our society. Um, think about the, the Spotlight documentary, if you know it. Uh, the the uh, journalists from the Boston Globe pressed into the cover-up of pedophilia and abuse in the Boston Catholic Diocese. They uncovered things like the way that suspected pedophiles may have been quietly moved to other parishes and allowed to continue to practice. Uh, it was a kind of shocking um, investigation that has uncovered terrible, terrible abuses done by people who claim to believe in God and love him. And it's been followed up in Australia with our Royal Commission here, which has uncovered similar issues. And so we can see, we see it again and again, publicly exposed in the news and the media, this, this great hypocrisy, uh, this great harm that people have done who claim to be followers of Jesus, saved by God. And alongside that, we've had a tremendous shift in public view about sexuality and gender. And as the landscape has changed about what people value and believe here, um, it's put ordinary faithful Christians and much of the world, much of human history really, now on the wrong side of a moral ledger. We're squarely in the immoral box. We are the, the bad guys. We're the bad guys. And so I, I want to take you through this because this sense that isn't God irrelevant in 2022, it's, it's not necessarily the, the burning questions that I had in 2008 from these year 12 students of, um, look, I'm about to go to uni, my life's fine. Why do I need to listen to you? Or aren't you a bit silly for believing this? Hasn't science explained things adequately? It's not so much that, it's the, it's the how dare you. It's the moral issue. It's a life issue. It's a how you live issue. I mean, if the people who believe in God are hypocrites who use religion to justify bigotry and harming others, then to say it's irrelevant is the politest way you can possibly come across to someone and say, wake up. Wake up. What are you doing? Leave this notion of God far behind. That's why today I want us to hear from Jesus. We've just heard him speaking. And I'd love you to keep your Bibles open, either on your phone or a paper copy in Matthew 23. Because he's got something to say into this moment and into this experience. And I hope you heard his tone, right? I hope you heard his tone. Here is angry Jesus. <laughs> Here is angry Jesus. He is deeply, deeply against hypocritical religion. 
let me just give you a brief introduction to who Jesus is. So going back 2,000 years, at Christmas, we just celebrated his birth, uh, the annual celebration. Uh, he was probably born around 4 BC. Um, when he was about 30 years old, he started a public teaching ministry, mostly in the north of Israel, a region called Galilee, and he traveled down to the south, to the capital city, Jerusalem, a few times. Uh, on a, like the annual trips there for this, the big feasts. He taught that the kingdom of God was coming, a kingdom where God's king would reign over people forever. And that in this kingdom, there'd be forgiveness. There'd be the knowledge of God. There'd be peace with God and one another. And there'd be the hope of eternal life in a new creation. And as he taught, he also performed these great signs that pointed to his authority to teach these things and gave clues to his identity. He healed people miraculously out of touch. He did things like walk across water where people were seeing him walk towards them and hop into the boat and then they went off together and they poked him just to make sure he wasn't a ghost. He fed thousands of people from a, a boy's lunch. And here he is, just days before he's about to die. He's in Jerusalem. He's in the great temple in Jerusalem that Herod has built, which is like one of the marvels of the ancient world. This extraordinary building with great stones that uh, to the people was the place where God dwelt uh, and showed that they were his people and he was their God. And here he is. He's just been in a series of confrontations with the religious leaders. And so that's where the context is. That's where we're about to hear him. It's, it's helpful to know that, so you hear him rightly. And just before we hear what he says to the crowds about the Pharisees and religious leaders, just look up the page, chapter 22, verse 41 to 46. This is the uh, end of a series of conflicts he's had with them that all center around his authority. And the Pharisees, who are these strict religious leaders in Israel, are gathered together and Jesus asks them, what do you think about the Messiah? That is God's chosen one, the king who's going to come to save. Whose son is he? And they answer, the son of David, who was one of the great kings of Israel. And God had promised him a thousand years earlier that his son would come and rule. And then so Jesus says to the Pharisees, well, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says... The Lord, that is the Lord God, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And here's the puzzle that Jesus hits them with. You're waiting, Pharisees, for a great king to come. The son of David, the promised chosen one, the rescuer of the world, the king of the world, the king of the nations. You're waiting for him. You're waiting for him. You're telling people, get ready. You're putting all these teachings and rules on people to get them ready. But the one who's going to come, he's going to be far greater than David. He's going to be so great that he's great David's greater Lord. And Jesus hits him with his puzzle. And I want you to think on that a little bit just as we go on, because we'll come back to it. What does Jesus have to say as he gets stuck into these religious leaders? Well, the first thing he does is he warns the people. He warns them. Kind of like a, a documentary expose. All right? He's in the temple, so it's public. The leaders are there. But he says to his disciples in the crowd, gather around. I want to warn you about these religious leaders. And this is something worth hearing. He gives a couple of warnings. Look at verses 1 to 12. His central warning is, in verse 3, do not do what they do. Do not do what they do. Because there's a deep issue with the Pharisees. And that is hypocrisy. Do not do what they do. It gives three reasons. One, they do not practice what they preach. If you wondered where that statement comes from, you know, practice what you preach. Maybe your, your friend said it to you at school. You, you got up and you're like, oh, we should all go and do this. I'm like, you don't do that, man. <laughs> or someone at work. Practice what you preach. Maybe your mum says it to you. Practice what you preach. That's Jesus said that. He's like, this is the issue with the Pharisees. The religious leaders, they don't practice what they preach. Second issue, verse four, they place heavy burdens on others 
but they're not willing to lift a finger to help. And this was how they were trying to get people ready for God to come and, and rescue them, is to give people all these rules and religious practices to follow, taking the law of God in the Old Testament and kind of expanding and expanding and expanding on it. But they would not lift a finger to help people, weighing them down with these religious practices. And the third thing is, he says in verses 5 to 7, everything they do is done for people to see. Everything they do is done for people to see. I do know people like that. He gives three examples. In verse 5, he says, they dress to impress, right? They wear boxes on their heads and they make them wide and they stick scrolls of the law in there. So you know they're religious, right? It's kind of like, you know, how do you know if a person's from Sydney? And they'll tell you. Right? And so like, how do you know this guy's a religious leader and a good bloke? Well, his uh, box, is, it's a big box. And his robes, they're fancy robes. You know, they dress to impress. They want you to see that they're, they're good. Then. The second thing is, he says, they love to sit in the place of honour. They love to. Um, we had Christmas dinner at home. And, uh, and you know, we, just, we let my dad, and we want dad, you sit there at the head of the table. Um, but they're like walking in and they come to your place. They'd be like, oh, I'll take that head of the table seat. Thanks very much. <laughs> you move on down. That's how we're going to sit here. And they love to be greeted with respect, Jesus says. You know, don't drop off the title. It's rabbi. It's rabbi. Right? It's doctor. It's professor. <laughs> you know these people. Yeah, they're, not, they're not so unfamiliar, are they? Yeah. Everything they do is done for people to see. Do you, you hear the issue? Jesus says, look at these religious leaders. You need to be warned about them. Don't do what they do. They're hypocrites. They don't practice what they preach. They burden you and they won't help. And everything they do is just because people are watching. They want that praise. They want that affirmation. They want the honour of others. And, and I want to ask you for a second, what do you think that means about their heart? Doesn't it show a heart that's self-centred, loves people's praise, egotistical, Right, these guys, they're kind of like the, um, the show dogs of mankind. They're poodles on display. And poodles are pretty, pretty ridiculous creatures. So we've got a poodle lover. <laughs> oh, poor poodles. But, what are they, a poodle supervisor? <laughs> to order up all these poodles. <laughs> uh, they're, they're funny dogs. They're like hedges, I think. They're hedges on all fours, right? They run around all trimmed up. That's a Pharisee. That's a Pharisee. You know, Jesus says, watch out, don't do what they do. Because he says, don't do it because this is so normal, right? Isn't that just so normal? You rock up to work and you work hard when people are watching and then you, you're out the rest of the time. You, you do the right thing when mom and dad are home and then they're gone and you do whatever you want. Do one thing on Facebook, do your another thing in private. Like that, that sense of hypocrisy, do not do what they do. It's just so normal. Isn't it the heart issue that each of us has? That we are deeply inconsistent and we know that. that we, we present one way and we, and we feel and think another. Um, we're one thing in public, another in private, another thing on Facebook. But Jesus, he's, he's, he's bringing this insight into their lives, into our hearts and showing us what we're like. And I just, just pause on our question for a second. Is God irrelevant? Can you just hear the relevance right now of Jesus' own insight into, into us, into you, into them? And what he gives to them next, he says, look, the kingdom I'm bringing is totally different. It turns these values upside down. Have a look in verse 11. After teaching them to kind of lower themselves before others, he says, verse 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Here's the pattern of life 
Jesus says, this is what life in my kingdom is like. Uh, it's so different. It's, it turns those values upside down. It calls for behaviors that challenge the heart and a heart that completely flips into new behaviors. Just to picture that, can't you? The, the greatest being the servant. You know, we've set up our democracy in Australia on these sort of values. That's why we have a prime minister. The word minister means servant, prime means first. It means that the greatest person in our country, the one we want to leave, lead us, is supposed to be the great servant, the first servant. Right? This is a principle it built into our democracy, coming from these values, from Jesus. And just think about that for a moment. You can sense, can't you, why this would be beautiful? Hitchens is deep issues with this. So Christianity says, brings in servilitude, like, it makes everyone into to slaves. As he reads the Bible, he's so doesn't understand it it's such a paper thin poor reading that's just mind-boggling to me because he's such an intelligent man but if you just think about this for a moment and listen to what jesus is saying just how, how beautiful would it be that if those with the greatest power used it with the greatest service of others if their lives were dedicated to lifting up the lowest and imagine if we were living this way, not seeking to exalt ourselves, but to humble ourselves before others. And what would that do? It would mean that we weren't now competing to you know, exalt ourselves over others by pushing them down, but we'd be kind of getting alongside, underneath, if you will, others to lift them up. What kind of a world would this create? A world where every person is lifted up by every other person and where people are not only happy to help others but so humble they're happy to receive help from others we are so humble you can gladly let someone else serve you now, that's a hard thing isn't it <laughs> it's a hard thing you know that person who's at the at the doing the dishes on christmas day and there's so many dishes that they're falling on the floor and they're like no 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 no, no. you sit down you sit down I, I, don't help me don't help me i want i'll help you right? it, it can be just as hard to receive help what, what a society. What a society. What kind of world would this create? Where people love to give help and love to receive it. Where the greatest is the greatest servant. Do you hear how Jesus' kingdom, this rule that he's creating, these people that he's shaping, it is in fact something beautiful. But it would, it comes into deep conflict with the heart with the human heart and so next he condemns the religious leaders he doesn't just warn people do not do what they do he then goes on the attack publicly like this is a a public takedown move and he just flat out condemns them he, he says to them seven times woe woe to you now, that's a way of saying, you know, the judgment of God come upon you. Woe to you. And he brings seven woes. And in fact, you know, by his coming, his teaching, and what's about to happen in the next few days, this judgment is going to fall on them. But if you just cast your eyes down, pick up the word woe at the start of different sentences, you'll see there's verse 13 and 14. Listen to these seven woes he brings. Woe to you. They, the Pharisees, they shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. They shut the way to life with God. Woe to you, verse 15. You go to great lengths to convert people, only to bind them for hell. Woe to you, the third one, verses 16 to 22. You teach people how to make promises that they don't have to keep. You do it in a way that desecrates God's holiness. Woe to you, the fourth one. Verses 23 and 24. You give a tenth down to the tiniest of your spices. You even tithe the cumin, right? Little grains. And yet you neglect the most important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Woe to you. The fifth one, verses 25 to 26. Outwardly, you are ceremonially clean, 
and inside full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, the sixth one, verse 27 to 28. You appear to people as righteous, but on the inside are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, the seventh woe, verses 29 to 34. You claim to be different to your ancestors who murdered the prophets, but you are their descendants and you will do just what they did. Now, do you hear the issues Jesus is picking up? These religious people are stopping people from truly coming to know God. Their religion is false, empty. It binds people for hell. It's full of hypocrisy. It creates religious loopholes. There's no regard for God. It's all about the face, all about what you look like on the outside, and has no power to change the heart. Ultimately, it's a religion that refuses to listen to God, refuses to love God, and refuses to love others and treat them with justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, that's an absolute political takedown piece to be speaking that in the temple of Jerusalem to the leaders of the nation, calling them out like this. But don't you think this still matters? Like, isn't that so irrelevant? <laughs> Because isn't this the issue? Isn't this the heart of what is so ugly in religion? The way that there are all these practices that actually obscure and hide God, where the people do horrible things in his name, the way that people front up to meetings like this, looking wonderful, but they go home and it's, abusive and wicked and greedy. The way that the religious mindset goes to tithe the tenth of the spice, and it doesn't care about justice and mercy and faithfulness. Don't you think this matters? Now, these issues are everywhere. And hypocrisy, right, hypocrisy isn't unique to those who believe in God or a higher power. Might just stand out the best, though. Now, this matters for me personally, I think. What if I'm like the Pharisees? Well, it's not even a what if. It's a to what extent am I like the Pharisees? You know, as I hear this, especially as I get up and speak to you, like the issue of hypocrisy is at the front of my mind. That's what I think about as I was preparing. It's why I couldn't sleep last night. Uh, it, it's the great struggle that, that I face, like to practice what I preach, to, to not do what they do. And one of the things I love as I come to church is what we said as we prayed to God and Vu stood up the front, right? He said, God, forgive us. Like he got up and on our behalf, as I was sitting there praying, he said, look, God, we, we've sinned against you. We failed to love you. We failed to treat people the way we should. Forgive us. That as we gather together as Christians, we are the people who gather with confession. We are the people who deal with hypocrisy by, by saying, we, we need you, God. We are messed up. We are sinful. We need your forgiveness. That's just an aside. But as I stand up, I think, yeah, this really matters. Yeah, it really matters. How else can we deal with this? How else? Can, if, if religion's exposed, if the knowledge of God is there, but we turn away from him, if we're one thing in public, another in private, this absolutely matters. And we get the sense of how much it matters when we hear Jesus' tone. Did you hear it? You hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, blind fools, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? 
Do you hear his tone? It matters. And so Jesus brings them a final verdict. He says to them, on this generation will fall the judgment of God for all the righteous blood shed on earth. This house, this temple will be left desolate, empty, destroyed. It's a fierce word of judgment. It's particular to that moment and those people, but it anticipates a final judgment where each one of us will have to stand before God. Yeah, is God irrelevant? You know, I don't think so. And if you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, he is, look at this harm he's doing. Just, just hear for a moment, right? Just pause, hear the heart of Jesus. He's deeply concerned about righteousness. He's deeply concerned about the heart. He says there cannot be hypocrisy. The judgment of God is coming upon these things. If you are angry about the wickedness done in the name of God and the cover-ups, he is more angry because he sees it more clearly and he loves more perfectly. Right? He is more good. He cares more. His words are not irrelevant. He really cares about the heart. And right now, we've seen these massive social movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter. We've seen the, the recent legalizing of an equality bill in Victoria. And one of the things that these movements have in common, and this might be part of why you're here, they take aim at people's hearts. It's partly why they're so controversial and, and difficult to engage with. It's because they're not just concerned about behavior. They're all taking aim at the heart. They want integrity. They want repentance and remorse and changed hearts. It's a movement that gets something that it's not enough to change laws. It's not enough even to change behaviors. We have to change hearts. Now, we might think that religion poisons everything or that things would be better without belief in God. But what Jesus shows us, I think, and what you can see as you look around at these movements and as you look at the way that New Year's resolutions never touch your own heart, <laughs> is that we don't need less of God. We actually need more. It's not that he's irrelevant. We actually need him more because these heart issues haven't changed. Jesus shows us this desperate state of our hearts, not caused by God, but unveiled by God and powerless to change without him. So if you just kind of go from like, you know, box screen to widescreen for a second, right? I got to sit in a movie theater in the holidays. It was amazing. But they, they, they didn't do the real widescreen where the, the curtains go back that way. They just lowered the top and the bottom. <laughs> this is uh, regional cinemas. But um, uh, what was I saying? Just here, here Jesus on the widescreen for a second, right? Because what he's saying has a big context, a big context of wonderful good news. You know, he's, he's speaking, he's saying, there is a God. There is a God. He does care about justice and mercy and faithfulness because he loves people. He cares about people. He cares about the honor of his name. And so there is judgment and an accounting. There will be consequences, good and bad. There is heaven and hell. And these things we're going to press into in a few weeks' time. There is, in fact, a Lord, a King, the great son of David, who's come. And Jesus, who we celebrated at Christmas, is the one who died, rose from the dead, and then ascended into heaven to reign at the right hand of God, who lives forever, ruling an eternal kingdom. There is an invitation to be part of this kingdom. You see, God is not irrelevant. He unveils our hearts. He shows the depths of the problems more clearly. But as we come to recognize that that means that we should actually face the same sort of condemnation that the Pharisees faced, we're met with wonderfully good news at the same time. We see Jesus who has compassion. Here are his last words here. Verse 37. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 
you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Hey friends, the Jesus who unveils the heart and who speaks to us about God and who brings in a kingdom that radically turns our world upside down, he is that greatest one who came to serve. And as he even stood amongst the Pharisees and the crowds in the temple, and even as he unveiled the deep hypocrisy that each one has, he actually meets that with compassion. He's the king who longs to gather hypocrites, right? He wants the hypocrites. Now, in our cancel culture, it's all, you're, you made mistakes and you're out, you're gone. Jesus, he wants you to come near. He gathers in the hypocrites. And the way that he does that principally is what he does three days later. He was killed on a cross. He did that to take a punishment, the consequences for our hypocrisy so that we'd be forgiven by God the Father. He did that to wash us clean in God's sight and to give us a new heart and put his spirit in us to teach us his ways and to share this life in an eternal kingdom. Yeah, who is Jesus? He's the king who draws near with compassion to the hypocrites, to the hypocrites. Now, they were not willing. And I just want to ask you, I want to finish with his question. Are you willing to come towards Jesus? Now, if you're here with a friend and you're just kind of visiting church, you've come and you're really angry at God, you're angry at the notion of God, I want to ask you today, are you willing to actually come near to this Jesus? It might mean something like, why don't you come back to the rest of the series as we look at things like, how can a loving God send people to hell? Or even better, it might be come to the Meeting Jesus series where you can explore who Jesus is. At the very least, we'd love to give you a Bible as you walk out of here so you can read him for yourself. With the rest of us who are here who do trust in Jesus, friends, it's great to hear again, isn't it? That God is not irrelevant this year. He's the God who exposes hearts. And the God who sends his son to do so. And yet that son, even as he exposes us completely, wants us to come near to him in great compassion. Let me pray. Well, God, I want to thank you so much that this is the God that you are, that you're not just the God who is there. You're not just the God that we need. You're not just our creator but you're the one who unveils the heart and yet calls us new. We pray that you'd help us to know you truly for who you are and to know Jesus and to delight in his compassion. I pray this in his name. Amen. Now, uh, as we said earlier, uh, that may have raised some questions for you. Um, I've only got one, uh, we've popped it up here. The people at our online have uh, sent through a couple as well. Uh, but if we don't get a chance to uh, answer your question today or you don't get a chance to ask it, uh, I'm going to throw this to Josh and I'm sure he'll say that's fine. Come find him after or come find me after or if there's someone around you uh, who looks half willing to answer a question, um, <laughs> feel free to ask them as well. Because the same reason we're uh, wrestling with these questions this month is the same reason we want to ask questions now and answer them is because we're convinced there are answers. And we're not always convinced we're going to know the best answers at the right time. Uh, You might feel that, uh, but we're convinced there are answers. So even if the answer is, come back next week, I'll have a bit of a think, that'd be great. We want you to be able to ask those. That's the type of place that we want this to be. the first question that's come up, Josh, is uh, for those people who uh, you mentioned there was that shift that happened from uh, 
isn't got irrelevant because science has made him outdated or because I, I, I don't need him. Uh, or, and at the end you said uh, how um, if we, uh, that, that Jesus is the one who is, is crying out to the hypocrites. What if we, that's not us. We don't feel like we're the weak person uh, at the start. We don't feel like the hypocrite. We don't feel like any of those things. And so is God still irrelevant for us? Uh, there, there might be, yeah, that God might not be uh, evil like I thought, but I don't need him. My life's pretty good. Uh, do you have a moment to quickly answer that question a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, if you, if that sense, I didn't fit into any one of those, maybe I humbly suggest you actually fit into the first one, which is the sense of I don't need God. Um, now, I think... Uh, there's a bunch of reasons why that is the case. Um, mostly it's because I think we get full and satisfied in life. Like life is a buffet. I've got all the different dishes I want. I can have them when I want. And so the sense of I don't, I don't really need him. Like I, I don't need anything else. Now, Jesus addresses this. Um, and uh, uh, he, he talks to a, a guy. So a guy comes up to him in the crowd and says, um, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's got this family will issue, which if you've been through one of those, it's terrible. And Jesus says you know, a surprising thing to him. He says, watch out. Life doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. And so what, there's more to this life than the stuff that you have, and the stuff that's going on in front of you. And then he tells him a story. Uh, he says, look, there's a rich man. He had a, a crops that were going well. He built bigger barns. He kept doing that. It stored up lots of wealth. He said, look, you've done well in life. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God says to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have? And Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, and so it is with everybody who's not rich towards God. You, know, there is, you have to take really seriously that you're going to die. That's <laughs> basically Jesus' point. And so this guy had come up and he's like, your parents just died, mate. You've got to take that really seriously. Um, there will be seasons of life where you feel, cool, I'm invincible. This is good for me. I don't need God. And then you die. So are you ready for that? Like that's Jesus' most blunt, helpful thing to say, right? He follows that up by saying, you know, don't worry about your life now because you need to know the God who's actually got you in control your life in his hands and it provides for you. But it's like, are you actually ready for that? Because that's the point where you're going to be standing before him, whether you were ready or not. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Because uh, of time, I'm going to just ask one more. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just going to address one of the questions uh, and then we'll sing and, and finish up. If you do have more questions though, uh, feel free, as I said, to, to raise them with Josh, myself or someone else. Uh, the, the last question that has come up is, oh, sorry, yeah, one of the main other questions that's come up is, what do we do in, with finding out if God is actually true? Like, there's a relevance question of, uh, there's lots of different things that claim to be the truth. How do we know if this is true? Um, but I'm going to jump in and answer that a little bit and say that's something that we will be looking at next, next week. week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so... Uh, That'd be a great thing to come to next week. Uh, if that has been your question, if you, you've looked at this and said, okay, well, maybe that's, um, you know, not completely irrelevant, but there's other things that claim to be truth. Uh, that's the, the question that we'll be looking at next week. Aren't all religions the same? Aren't all ways to God or, or all means of finding out truth the exact same? That's actually the one, that it's, it's a, the right question to ask out of this. And that's one of the reasons we put it next week. And so... Uh, we'll be digging into that. It's, it's too big to really answer in the couple of minutes that we have now. Um, but again, we think there's answers, so come and hear that. Um, thanks, Josh. Ask those questions later. The band are going to lead us uh, in our final song uh, where we'll get to reflect on not only have we seen that God uh, is relevant, but that God has compassion on us, that God is a good God. He's not an irrelevant God. He is there and he is good. And so we're going to sing our final so song uh, the love of the Father Week, where we get to reflect on the fact that God has shown that compassion, that love to us. So stand and sing this final song together.